This is amazing, amazing. Great, great. Well, I think it's 6.05 and we'll get started. Welcome everybody to the um, exciting world of multi uh, what multifamily uh, meetup um, presented to you by Excite Capital. I am Dr. Julius Oni, I'm the CEO co-founder at Excite Capital and co-hosting today with me is the entire Excite Capital team led by myself, um, um, Mr. Leslie Awesom, who is our co-founder and director of operations and Mr. Tenny Tolofari, um, our co-founder and um, um, director of acquisitions. We also have all the Excite Capital member teams that are going to be interacting with you today, including Braden and Kailea. So uh, we look forward to a great, fantastic um, uh, um, uh, discussion with our amazing guests today and cannot wait to, uh, to get into it. And um, just as a quick introduction, Brian Burke does not really need much introduction for anyone who is really interested in uh, multifamily real estate. He is the president and CEO of Praxis Capital, a, private re a real estate private equity firm uh, that he founded in 2001. Um, I mean, Brian is invested in multiple, multiple uh, single family, multifamily, and, and other residential assets in uh, multiple U.S. growth markets. Um, he has invested in thousands and thousands of multifamily units. He was just saying to me earlier that he, he so, his company sold um, 2,000 units last year, and this year already they've sold over 500 units. We can only all aspire to be <laughs> just like him. Um, but most importantly is, uh, I, I mean, besides the incredible, um, uh, you know, number of units that, that Brian has personally transacted, um, he also has in, a, an incredible amount of experience um, with educating a lot of us about multifamily um, real estate investment. I particularly We'll never forget after reading and Self Investor, the insider's guide to investing in passive real estate um, syndications, that really opened up a, a new world to me. And I frequently recommend that book to almost anybody who is interested in learning more about either passive invest, investing in real estate, but even if you're actively interested in investing in real estate, this book is a, is, is a must have. So I've We've had a lot of you know, industry leaders on this platform, and I'm particularly super excited today to say that on, on this day, we have Brian Burke coming in, interacting with us and educating us. And I cannot wait to uh, see what the you know, uh, conversation and this discussion is gonna be about. So without further ado, you guys did not come here to hear me talk today. I'm gonna to pass it right on to, to Mr. Brian Burke. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks, Julius. I appreciate that incredible introduction. Uh, I can't imagine that uh, I deserve all those kind words, but I certainly appreciate uh, you uh, letting people know a few things about my background. I'll go into a little bit more of it here in just a little bit when we, we get into the meat of what we're here to talk about today. And uh, I have some uh, slides I'm going to run through with you guys and kind of show you a few things about passive real estate syndications. Then we'll have some time to open up for some questions at the end. So as we go along, if you have a question, feel free to uh, type that question to the chat box or the Q&A box. And uh, you know, we'll be sure to get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, here towards the end, or if I happen to see any of them as we're as we're going through it, I'll try to catch them. But it's a little bit difficult for me to see them uh, when I'm doing the presentation. But uh, you know, I'm sure you've probably read a lot of books on uh, real estate investing itself. And you know, I'm not here so much to talk about uh, real estate investing. It's more about talking about investing passively in real estate syndications. Uh, and or a sponsoring real estate syndication. So, you know, if you decide that, you know, all you've learned about multifamily real estate, you don't want to do all that work, uh, then, you know, this is the, this next hour is for you. This will show you how you can invest in real estate without having to do all that work. 
Uh, or what if you decide that uh, you don't want to just buy properties for yourself, you'd rather scale your business to be much larger uh, than it is by bringing in outside investors so that you can buy more property than you'd be able to do on your own. Uh, if that describes you, uh, then this, this next hour might be for you because we're going to be talking about real estate syndications, mostly from the standpoint of the passive investor, but that's also so applicable to the investment sponsor too, because when you kind of think about it this way, that you're going to be tested by your investors and I'm giving the investors all the questions they should be asking, which means you're going to know which questions they're going to ask. And you'll also have the answers to those questions and, and be prepared for when an investor comes to you uh, with a lot of questions and kind of just a funny story related to that. When, when I wrote this book, uh, anybody who buys the book on Bigger Pockets uh, from the Bigger Pockets bookstore gets some bonus content. And one of the pieces of bonus content is a question list of, I think it's like 80 or 90 questions that you should you know, ask your real estate sponsor. And uh, I think about six times now, we've actually had somebody send us that list. Like, can you answer all of these questions? And it's like, well, I actually wrote those questions. So I think we'll do okay there. Uh, so you know, pay attention to what we're talking about here today and you'll know the answers to some of those questions yourself. So I'm gonna share a screen with you guys uh, that'll have uh, some slides. So let's get that up for you. All right, there we go. So you should be able to see uh, these slides here on your screen. Uh, and uh, let's move on to just a little bit about uh, my background and how I came to uh, be where I'm at today. Um, I've bought over 4,000 multifamily units and uh, over 700 single family homes on a, you know, most of the single family homes were buying flips. I did buy about 120 single family rental homes, which I don't own any of them anymore. I'm thankful to say. Uh, in my 33 year career now, I guess uh, going on 33 years, I uh, bought over $800 million in real estate. And also just over the last four years, I started up a lending company, lent over a billion dollars uh, to real estate investors. Uh, started out, you know, when I was fresh out of high school, uh, uh, I couldn't do it on my own because I didn't have any money. So uh, I've just kind of done everything through uh, passive investors investing in our opportunities. Uh, I've got, I've had over 1500 uh, passive investors that have invested with me uh, in over 40 real estate offerings, contributing over $250 million worth of uh, investor equity. And it was, it was that that kind of prompted me uh, to write the hands off investor. Uh, I'm going to get into that book just a little bit more here uh, as we uh, get down a little further. Now, I couldn't have done all this stuff by myself, and thankfully, I didn't have to. I have a really good team uh, with me here at the company. Uh, I founded this company in 2001, which really I'd already been doing it for 12 years by that point, but finally decided to incorporate. And since then, brought in a whole C-suite team of really experienced folks. Uh, who have way more experience than even I do. Uh, you know, my guys have between 20,000 and 45,000 units of multifamily experience each. So in, as a company, we now have over 106,000 uh, units of multifamily experience. Our operating footprint is pretty much national. We've, we've owned just about everywhere, it seems. Uh, more lately, more focused in the southeastern and southern U.S. Uh, we're starting to get out of West Coast states right now, but certainly have a, a focus on East Coast states. Talked about the book uh, up at the top of the hour here, The Hands-Off Investor, An Insider's Guide to Investing in Passive Real Estate Syndications. Uh, this is probably what I'm best known for outside of investing circles. This book came to be after a friend of mine had made an investment in a passive real estate syndication and lost her entire life savings. She went from being basically set up for an easy retirement to having to work for a rideshare service just to put food on the table. I felt like if there was one thing I could do to prevent that from happening to just one person, that effort would be worth it. And the hands-off investor was born, wrote this book with the hope that people would read this before making passive real estate investments and hopefully avoid making the same mistakes that my friend made 
which maybe can uh, save you from a lot of heartache and pain down the line. Let's get started off on, first of all, what is a syndication? Uh, so the, the root word of syndication is syndicate. And the Oxford Dictionary defines a syndicate as a group of individuals or organizations combined to promote some common interest. In other words, uh, you know, you're getting together uh, uh, some investors along with uh, someone that's responsible for the organization, and you have a goal to accomplish something like, you know, buy an apartment complex, for example. That that's uh, one of the most common uses for a syndicate. It's what we're going to talk most about here today. But not to be outdone, Merriam-Webster also has a, a definition for the word syndicate, and their definition is a loose association of racketeers in control of organized crime. Now, your job as a passive investor is to figure out when you're thinking of investing in a syndicate, which one are you investing in? Are you investing in someone that has your common interest or are you investing with someone that's a racketeer that's a, a, a running a crime syndicate that's there to steal your money? So we're going to run through a few things uh, that will hopefully help you get further along in making the determination on which is which. But before we get there, uh, let's talk a little bit about what a syndication uh, really is from a practical level. Let's say that you're going to buy this apartment complex right here. You're going to need two things in order to buy uh, that apartment complex. You're going to need debt and you're going to need equity. Uh, so when a syndication is going to be formed, the first thing that will happen is a syndication sponsor, which is a company like mine, or maybe even like yours, uh, or maybe someone you know, uh, that syndication sponsor is going to locate a lender, maybe a bank. Uh, that bank is going to provide a loan to the syndication sponsor that the syndication sponsor will use for the debt needed to buy that real estate. The next thing that sponsor is going to do is they're going to go to their uh, client base of passive investors. And those passive investors are going to uh, invest money with the syndication sponsor. That sponsor will then turn around and invest that money into the, uh, the purchase of the real estate as the equity component. So we got debt coming from a lender, we got equity coming from investors, and we have a syndication sponsor in the middle who's basically controlling the whole thing, locating the real estate, locating the investors, locating the lender, guaranteeing the loan, all the different things that are associated with the acquisition of the real estate. But more importantly, uh, they're also responsible for overseeing the real estate uh, as you um, as you own it and get through the management process. Kind of a funny thing about syndications is people always are your syndicators. They always like to talk about, uh, you know, how good they are at acquiring real estate. But sometimes what they fail to acknowledge is that acquiring the real estate is really just the first, you know, couple months of a multi-year operation, which is to own, manage and operate that real estate over a long period of time and provide a good outcome for the investors. That's really where the rubber meets the road. So it's just kind of a real important distinction there. Now there's two types of syndicators. Uh, one type of syndicator is an operator. Uh, an operator is one who raises money from investors uh, to buy real estate uh, and they will own that real estate directly. The other kind of uh, syndicator is a joint venture fund. And what a joint venture fund will do is they'll raise money from their client base of investors and they will in turn invest that money with an operator, perhaps alongside the operator's capital or the operator's investor's capital. And I bring this up because it's important for you to realize uh, who you're investing with when you're considering a syndication investment. Are you investing directly with the operator or are you investing in a joint venture fund? And where this becomes somewhat uh, important is when you're comparing investments based upon the investment terms. So in other words, you might look at uh, an investment and say, well, uh, you know, this company is offering a 70-30 split of the profits but that company is offering an 80-20 uh, split of the profits. So I'm gonna go with the 80-20 firm because I get a higher percentage of the profits. Well, what you might not realize is that uh, that 80-20 firm might be a joint venture fund where they're in turn investing with an operator who also gets a cut. 
So in that case, instead of getting 100% of 70%, like you would get if you fasted directly with the operator, you're getting uh, seven, you're getting 80% of 70%. Uh, which is even less. So it, it's just important to know uh, there's nothing wrong with investing with a joint venture fund. It's just important to know whether the uh, firm you're investing with is an operator or a, or a joint venture. There's also two types of syndications to keep in mind. One type of syndication is a single asset syndication. This is where uh, the group buys one property. And the other kind of syndication is a fund. And this would be where uh, the, the syndication sponsor through the fund investors would buy multiple properties. And there's a couple of different kinds of funds. There's a, an identified asset fund, which is one where uh, the sponsor will show you, you know, here's the two properties we're buying, or here's the five properties we're buying, or here's the 10 properties we're buying. And then there's another kind of fund, which is called a blind pool. And a blind pool fund is one where the operator will say something like, uh, we don't have anything identified for the fund, but we're going to buy uh, 100 unit and larger multifamily apartments built after 1980 in the southeastern United States, for example. They'll create some kind of a box and they'll buy whatever deals they can find that fit that box. Uh, there's, there's a couple variations on the fund structure. One fund is an, an open-end fund, and this is one where uh, you can invest at any time, and sometimes you can even get out at any time. And there's others that are closed-end funds where it might be open for a short period of time until they raise the commitment amount, then they close the fund. Nobody gets in, nobody gets out, uh, and the fund uh, you know, goes and acquires the real estate. There's also a little bit of a hybrid approach to this whole thing, and that might be uh, a blind pool fund that has a seed asset or maybe a couple seed assets. And what this would be is where they would say, you know, this is the box that we're going to be buying in, but we already have the first asset or the first two assets. And here they are. So you can see what these two look like. And then we're going to buy more that are going to look similar to this. Uh, so those are essentially the different kinds of funds uh, that are out there. Now there's two types of operators. There's operators that self-manage and there's operators that use third-party management. Uh, in the case of a third-party management situation, in that case, the sponsor is simply the asset manager and they're overseeing the property manager who's in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the property in terms of uh, locating tenants, managing the on-site staff and all those different things. Operators who self-manage, they have their own uh, internal management structure that they use for the purpose of, um, of managing those real estate assets. So getting into kind of the meat of investing in a syndication, 54% of high net worth individuals that have uh, real estate in their portfolio invest passively in private real estate offerings, according to a national real estate investor online study. Uh, so you kind of wonder, what is it that these high net worth investors know that maybe people who don't invest in passive syndications don't know? Well, to start with, I think that the, the big thing that they understand is the concept of leverage. Now, when normally in a real estate presentation, we talk about leverage, we're talking about using debt to amplify your equity returns, but that's not what I'm talking about here. In this case, what I'm talking about when I mention leverage is I'm talking about you leveraging different things that the sponsor has to make your life easier. So for example, that would be leveraging the sponsor's time so you can spend your time doing other things, whether that's golfing, sailing, maybe you have a, a really uh, good job that's really high paying and you enjoy doing that. You don't want to uh, be running around looking at real estate for hours and days on end and traveling all over the country. You would rather just do what it is you want to do and let somebody else do all of that extra work. So real estate syndications allow you to leverage the sponsor's time for uh, them to do all those things. You can also leverage the sponsor's knowledge to make the right investment in the right place at the right time. If you're investing with the right group, they should have uh, some experience and some knowledge that they can use to add value to what you're trying to do in your real estate investment goals. Next is to leverage the sponsor's team, not only to locate and arrange opportunities, but also to professionally manage the asset once it's acquired. And again, I go back to my statement from earlier that oftentimes uh, sponsor groups have a tendency to place a lot of emphasis on the acquisitions process 
and not a lot of emphasis on the operations process. And, and really the, uh, the investment returns are gonna be made or broken at the asset management phase of this, of this thing. Uh, they can project all kinds of returns. You can look at their underwriting and try to sort out whether or not uh, they're projecting correctly, if they're using good assumptions, if their math is off, you can do all of that stuff. But if they're really lousy operators or bad managers, none of that's gonna matter anyway. Next, you wanna be able to leverage the sponsor's experience, contacts, and systems to source deals that you couldn't source on your own. And, and let's face it, when you're uh, looking at a national scale, uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. A lot of our investors are tech employees in the Silicon Valley. And they work, you know, 80 hours a week, maybe more. Uh, they don't have time to be running around uh, looking at real estate. And even if they did, they don't really know who to call. So with us, we have network uh, all over the country. We know all the brokers in all the major markets. They contact us to buy properties from them even before they go on the market. And that's access to deal flow that an individual investor couldn't just have on their own because that broker isn't calling that individual investor. They're like, you know, they're, they're not bothering with people who have full-time jobs that are outside of this scope. They, they really are focusing on people that they've done business with before, uh, that they know will close and that sort of stuff. So real important uh, that you get access to that deal flow and the best way to get that access is by partnering with the right syndication sponsors. Next is you're leveraging the sponsor's financial strength. That, you know, that, that includes things like balance sheet, reserves, credit rating. And this is so that the, the group can get the best financing terms. Uh, you know, maybe your credit isn't all that great. Well, it doesn't matter. You can still invest in real estate uh, through a syndication. You're contributing capital. Your credit rating doesn't matter. Uh, what if, you know, you don't have a ton of reserves in cash? Uh, maybe all of your investments are committed to long-term investments and you don't have access to boatloads of reserves. If you were to invest on your own, a lender is going to require you to typically have around 10% of the loan amount in cash reserves. So if you're buying a $100 million property and that requires a $60 million loan and they require $6 million of, you know, liquid reserves, well, maybe you don't have $6 million in liquid reserves, but you can leverage the sponsor's balance sheet for them to bring those reserves so you don't have to. Uh, also, they might require that, the, that your net worth is equivalent to the loan amount. That's not an uncommon requirement at all. If you don't have a $60 million net worth to, to, uh, uh, to be able to put up uh, to, for that lender, you wouldn't qualify for the financing. So you can leverage the sponsor's balance sheet uh, for them to be able to get that financing uh, that you couldn't get on your own. Next is you're leveraging the sponsor's market research and skill to maximize the business plan by making decisions that either maximize return or minimize downside, such as identifying multiple exit strategies, for example. And then there's also uh, leveraging the capital of other investors. Uh, as a group, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you can buy and invest in deals that are larger than you can or would invest in on your own. Uh, you know, maybe uh, you don't have the money to buy a $50 million apartment complex on your own, but by partnering with other investors in a passive real estate syndication, you can own a share of that $50 million apartment complex. Or let's say that you do have enough capital on your own to buy a $50 million apartment complex, but that's all the money you would have. Well, would you want to commit all of your resources to just one investment? And the answer is probably not. You would probably rather spread your money around. So investing in passive real estate syndications gives you an easy way to do that. You can invest smaller uh uh, allocations of capital in a variety of different investments with different sponsors investing in different real estate strategies in different geographical markets with the, uh, with the goal here of being to eliminate any single point of failure. If the sponsor fails, you still have other sponsors. Uh, if the uh, market uh, you know, goes down the toilet in one city, 
then you still have other markets. If one asset class is unfavorable, you still have other asset classes. That diversification is what gives you the ability to uh, you know, have a safe, lower risk investment strategy. So just going over kind of an example of why people might invest in a passive real estate syndication. This is a, an example I think uh, uh, Julius mentioned at the top of the hour that you know we had sold uh, 2,000 units last year. This is just one example of a property that we had bought two and a half years prior for about $18.5 million. Um, all total, we were into it for about 23 after renovations, sponsor fees, and so on. Uh, we sold that property two and a half years later for 30 million, uh, which you know was a seven million dollar gain on less than seven million dollars of equity. So basically, doubling, almost doubling people's money. It was a little bit over a 2x gross multiple and a 1.79 net multiple to investors uh, in two and a half years. Uh, over a 25% internal rate of return and over a 10.5% average cash on cash. This is one of the reasons why people invest in passive real estate syndications. Uh, it's a great way to make uh, good returns on your money without having to do all of the work. Now, I had a ton more examples of this last year, you know, in those uh, many thousands of units that we sold. You know, one example just comes off the cut, off my mind quickly. We did have a property we bought for $40 million that we sold for $62 million that we'd owned for less than two years. That was another example of one of last year's exits. We had another one that numbers were very similar to that. Uh, and then we have this year uh, property that we're selling that we bought a year and a half ago uh, for 32 million that we're now looking to sell at 60 million. So it's amazing what's happened in the market. Prices have ramped up really quickly, but these are the kind of reasons why people invest in passive real estate syndications, even though those kind of outlier returns aren't what I would expect to see uh, going into the future. Uh, There's still a really good opportunity to beat the stock market. So thinking about investing in passive real estate syndications, let's go over five things you should look for and one thing that you should definitely avoid. Uh, the first thing that you should look for is the team of people that you're investing with. Now under team, I got three categories of things we wanna look for in this team. And each of those has its own uh, set of uh, little minor subtopics. The first one is experience. You want a team that has a lot of experience and, and by experience, I mean, four different kinds of experience. One is market cycle experience. In other words, have they actually survived an adverse market cycle? Uh, another one is full cycle experience, meaning have they successfully bought, managed, and sold a property and delivered a tangible result uh, for their investors? Or have they only just bought a bunch of stuff but they've never sold anything, or maybe they even haven't managed anything for very long. Uh, I like to say that you know groups that are in that situation have learned how to take off, but they haven't learned how to land the plane yet. Uh, before you get on board, you want to make sure that they know how to take off and land. Uh, next one is the local market. Do they have experience investing in that local area? Every market is different and has nuances, and you want to know that the team has some experience there. And lastly is product type. Uh, if that uh, group has only done apartment buildings and now they're proposing to do a hotel, uh, they might not be a very good partner for you right now because they don't have experience in hotels. Uh, so you'd want to know that they have experience in the, in the product type that they're offering you to invest in. Uh, so look for all four of those. If you can check all four boxes, you've got a real winner. Next is their track record kind of going along with experience, except this is the way that they document this experience and show you that they've uh, been able to successfully produce a result and give you some kind of an exhibit that can show you what those results have looked like. Uh, what do those returns look like? Have, uh, you know, what, uh, what properties underperformed? Did they even put those in their exhibit or are they hiding them from you? And if they did put them in there, it's a great way to start a conversation about what they did uh, when those investments were going off the rails. How did they get, how did they write the ship? How did they get to the finish line? What did they do? You know, how a sponsor acted when the chips are down is way more revealing than anything they can show you about what happened when everything was going right. And then finally, 
uh, do they have a brand to protect? And this is, you know, maybe even more important than it sounds, but if the, if the sponsor group has been around for a long time and everybody knows who they are, uh, they can't just simply throw their hands in the air, give up, you know, pack up, uh, abandon the investment, and then reappear under a new flag uh, and start all over again. Uh, instead, when things aren't going right, they have to fight to the death to save that investment. Uh, and somehow get that thing to the finish line, no matter what, because they're there to protect their brand. And they want, you know, they want to show uh, future investors, uh, you know, how they were able to perform. And, and if they have a really solid brand, that speaks really highly. If you've never heard of them before, neither has anybody else. Uh, well, you know, maybe they need to get their feet wet a little bit more uh, before you're ready to jump in the pool with them. The next thing to look for uh, in a passive uh, investment is its suitability. And when I talk about suitability, I, I mean a few different boxes that you need to check. The first one is, does the investment meet your needs? And so here's a couple of examples. If you're retired and you live off the income of your investments, you need that investment to produce cash flow. Uh, so if you're going to invest in, in any passive syndication, you want to be sure that it's one that's likely to produce cash flow, such as stabilized uh, multifamily assets, uh, maybe some seasoned office properties, that sort of stuff. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for you or suitable for you to invest in a ground up construction deal that's going to have no cash flow during the period of ownership. Conversely, if you've got great income, you have a great job, you don't need uh, the money, but you want to see your capital grow. Uh, you might not want to invest in like a, you know, single digit IRR, uh, stabilized, uh, you know, no upside deal that produces good cash flow, but really has no capital growth. Uh, that's maybe not what you're looking for and might not be suitable for you. Uh, another category of suitability is does it match your risk tolerance? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're getting up there in years and you can't afford to make your money back, investing in a risky ground up development deal might not be very suitable for you. Uh, but yet if you're young and you got, you can always make the money back and you just want to try to maximize your returns, maybe a ground up development is just fine. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got really high risk tolerance, uh, and you're looking for maximum results, maybe investing in something that's a low risk, steady, class A, core uh, opportunity might not be the most suitable for you in terms of satisfying your needs. Next category of suitability is liquidity, or I should almost say the lack thereof. Uh, you need to know that the lack of liquidity is okay. Uh, are you going to be able to uh, separate from this capital for a long period of time, uh, or are you gonna need that money back relatively soon? If you think you're going to need your money in two years, don't invest in a real estate syndication with a 10-year sunset. Even a two-year one is questionable because it might end up getting extended if things aren't going so well when it's time to sell. Uh, so just uh, make sure that uh, that lack of liquidity uh, is actually okay. Next thing to look for is, uh, is the market. Uh, in, in market, what I'm talking about here is kind of from a, a high level uh, you know, what does the overall uh, market look like where you're going and where you're going to invest? And there's three main drivers that push valuation of commercial income real estate. And those three main drivers are job growth, income growth, and population growth. Without any of those, whatever property you buy isn't going anywhere. It's kind of like throwing a rowboat in the middle of a lake uh, it's just going to sit there and you know flounder around a little bit, but it's not actually going to travel anywhere. Uh, instead, what you want to do is you want to throw your rowboat in a fast-moving stream where the you know the current is going to carry you. Uh, that's a market that has a lot of job growth, income growth, and population growth because those things will drive rents, which will drive. Will, I should say it'll drive demand, which will drive rents, and then which in turn will then drive uh, valuation. Now, there's one caveat to this, though, in that you want to have um, at least a good foundation of economic diversification in the market uh, that you're looking at. 
And I'll give you one good example. Uh, if you go look, look at Midland and Odessa, Texas, uh, these are two markets in central Texas that at times will have very strong job growth, income growth, and population growth. However, the entire local economy is based upon one industry, and that one industry is oil. Uh, right now, oil is doing pretty darn good, and there's probably going to be rig counts going up and so on because of what's going on in the, in the overall global oil climate. But when things are not going well in oil industry, rig count start going down, there's less drilling. When there's less drilling, that means that there's fewer drillers. When there's fewer drillers, that means fewer uh, people working in restaurants and hotels and even all the way down to doctors and dentists. So, you know, if somebody I met once uh, that lives in Midland, Texas told me everybody is in the oil business. It doesn't matter what business you work in, in that town, everyone's in the oil business. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, volatility in a market that doesn't have economic diversification. And that job growth, income growth, and population growth can turn on a dime. And you can be stuck with a rapidly deflating asset um, when that wasn't what you'd planned for. So, you know, be careful when selecting markets to not only make sure that they have growth, but they have diversification. Next is the real estate. Um, you know, in real estate, we're thinking about uh, several different things. We're thinking about the location, and that location could mean two things. One is it could mean what city is it in, you know, or what what macro uh, market is it in, and then you can get all the way down to uh, micro level. So that would be things like, uh, is it at the corner of Maine and Maine, uh, you know, or does it have a lot of um, drive-by traffic visibility. So, uh, for example, if you're investing in a self-storage property, uh, traffic count would be a really important factor for you. Uh, how many homes are within a three-mile radius would be a very important factor for you. Uh, but if you were investing in a hotel, uh, the number of homes in a three-mile radius and traffic count might not matter at all, Instead, what might matter is proximity to a freeway artery, proximity to an airport, uh, things like that, that would give demand uh, to a hotel property. The next thing to look for is the quality of the real estate. Uh, you know, is it a rundown, you know, uh, older property that needs a lot of work? Uh, or is it brand new, like just finished construction? Uh, and then what is the business plan and does the business plan match up with the quality of the property? So this gets into the strategy discussion of, okay, you've got a 50 or 60 year old property that's a little bit run down and the strategy is to buy it, do nothing and just raise rents and live the high life. Well, that might not quite work because really what the property needs is an injection of capital to put on new roofs, upgrade apartment interiors and so on and so on. Uh, so you'd want to make sure that the strategy that's being outlined matches the quality of the asset, such as if you have a brand new asset and they're proposing we're going to go in and renovate all the units, those two don't jive. So just make sure that, uh, that the business plan and the property of the asset matches up and that the strategy seems appropriate for the real estate and the location and the overall market that this investment is being placed in. Now we're about to wrap up. I've got one more slide that's gonna talk about the assumptions. Uh, and then pretty soon after that, we're gonna uh, open this up for some questions. So if you have questions, don't forget to uh, type those questions in the uh, Q&A box or the chat box. And uh, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can, but uh, let's get to uh, the assumptions. Now, when you're analyzing an offering that's presented to you by a sponsor and you're considering investing in it, uh, the important thing to look at is the assumptions that were made. There's an old saying in computers that says garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you know, a computer isn't going to give you anything better than what you put into it. And the same goes for a passive real estate syndication. If all of the assumptions that the sponsor is using are garbage, the returns that they're projecting are also garbage, meaningless and not even worth looking at. So, uh, here's a few things for you to take a look at when you're looking at the sponsor's financial assumptions. They should present you with a slide deck or some kind of information booklet that will describe the opportunity that they're asking you to invest in. Uh, it, within there, they should be showing you uh, the rents that they're projecting to get 
Uh, and generally those rents are gonna be an increase over the in-place rents. And they're justifying that because maybe they're gonna do some renovations or they're gonna uh, upgrade the apartment units or the markets had some really rapid rental appreciation recently. Whatever the case may be, you wanna show, see that they've shown you some data from other uh, properties in the area that have achieved those results to support their thesis. The second is that they have reasonable rent growth assumptions. And, and even if the assumptions seem like they're outlandish, have, are they able to support those assumptions with some kind of third party research or studies? Not just, well, we think rent growth is going to be 9%. Well, do they show you a report from somebody that's not them saying that rent growth is going to be 9%? And if they do, um, and that's a reliable source, then maybe 9% is perfectly reasonable, uh, but you just want to see that it's supported by something. Uh, the next is physical and economic vacancy factors. Uh, this is a common one where you'll see, uh, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I see some syndicators make is they'll look at the property and it's 3% vacant. And so they'll do their financial projections and they'll say, uh, you know, we're going to be 3% vacant. Well, I can tell you here right now, not going to happen. They might even say, we're going we're gonna to be conservative and we're going to assume 5% vacancy because the property is at three now, but we're going to be conservative and say five. Well, that's also meaningless. What matters more than anything is what's the market vacancy factor where that property is located and can they support that market vacancy factor with some third party research and studies that show that that's what the market vacancy is. And why this is important is generally, so they're telling you on one side of their mouth, that uh, the rents are low and they're telling you on the other side of their mouth that they're gonna maintain occupancy. Well, the reason the property is 97% occupied is because the rents are $300 below market. As soon as they exercise their plan and invest money in fixing it up and bring the rents up to market, their vacancy factor is gonna go right along with everyone else's, which is gonna be whatever the market vacancy factor is. And if that's 7%, they'd better be projecting a 7% vacancy because you can't have it both ways. You can get a 3% vacancy of an under market rents, or you can have market rents and a market vacancy, but you can't have um, you know, under market vacancy and over market rents. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, one quick test that I like to look at, people have asked me before, like, you know, is there any way to tell if the sponsor is not going to meet their financial projections in like 30 seconds? And I would say there's one test you can do that might give you a clue whether those projected returns are likely to be met. And that clue would be to look at, a, look for a large jump in first year income. And where you'll see this is like, if the sponsor gives you a comparison of the last 12 months of income, and I'm talking about gross income before expenses, they give you, uh, they give you a, th this gross income number for the last 12 months, or even maybe they'll do the last three months times four, they'll annualize it. Like, this is where the property is now. And then they'll show you first year projection for that income, which is way higher uh, than the, what the property is currently collecting. Just in an instant like that, I can tell you they're not gonna meet their uh, return projections because they'll tell you, well, we're gonna increase all the rents, uh, which may be true, but I can tell you that that doesn't happen overnight. They can't increase the rents the day of closing. Instead, what's gonna happen is it's gonna take two or three years for them to renovate units as tenants move out, as leases renew, as they get new people in there. Uh, and it's gonna take time for those rents to be uh, brought to market. So you should see, see instead a gradual increase in that, in that gross collected rent, not a big, huge one-year jump. So that's one like quick test you can do just to see in a matter of seconds. Uh, the next thing is sale price projections. Uh, how are they arriving at their exit valuation? Or, or are they even explaining how they arrive there? It's funny, you look at a lot of these investment packages and you go, okay, they say they're buying this at 10 million and they're selling it for 20, but how do they arrive at this 20 million? Is this just a wild guess? You know, how did they come up with this number? Uh, so uh, uh, try to look for how they came up with that. And generally the way you'll do that is they'll use an exit cap rate and then they'll use that cap rate to calculate a future sale price. That, calc that, that future sale price is then dependent upon two variables. 
one being the cap rate itself and the other being the projected income in the year of sale uh, that they're using. And if they're off on either one, they're gonna be off on the sale price. The only guarantee I can offer you is that they're gonna be off. Uh, first of all, you're never gonna get the exact income that you projected. It might be higher, it might be lower, but it's never gonna be exact. The second is you don't know what the cap rate's gonna be a year, two years, three years, five years, or 10 years from now. Uh, anyone that's making a, an estimate is taking a guess. So the, the question that you have as a passive investor is, what guess are you making and how did you arrive at that guess? And does that seem logical and reasonable to me? And that's how I'm going to determine whether or not that exit sale price makes any sense at all. Next is property taxes. This is usually a big miss you'll see on some of these offerings where uh, they fail to adjust property taxes for a reassessment on sale. Now, in some jurisdictions, when you buy a property, the sale price is going to trigger the tax assessor to reassess the value of the real estate. And the property taxes, of course, are based on a percentage of that value. So if there's a big jump in the valuation, there's going to be a big jump in the property taxes. And oftentimes you'll see a sponsor package that will have a 3% increase in property tax, for example, or maybe no increase in property tax uh, expense, for example. Uh, and in some jurisdictions, that might be completely uh, fair and accurate. Uh, states like Arizona, for example, don't reassess valuation upon sale. Instead, they just have a, basically a flat increase every year. Um, but there's other states like Texas, California, Georgia, Florida, when they see those sales happen, they're going to reassess uh, the valuation of that property. and They're going to charge you a higher tax bill. Now, I can think of no worse example than California. Uh, in California, they have a thing called Proposition 13. And what Proposition 13 does is when you buy a property in California, it will set the assessed value at the amount of the purchase price. And then it will increase 2% uh, a year. And that's it. So let's say somebody bought a property 30 years ago, their assessed valuation is gonna be their 30 years ago price plus a 2% inflation factor every year for the next 30 years. Yet the value of the property might've gone up 100X. So therefore the property taxes are gonna go up like 75X after factoring in for that 2% uh, that inflationary multiplier. So property taxes could be dramatically different than historical. And you need to make sure that the sponsor has accounted for that uh, when analyzing their first year uh, income and their, in, and their expenses going forward. Finally, is the sponsor raising enough money to execute the business plan? Uh, I can tell you oftentimes they don't. They forget expenses. They don't know about them. Maybe they didn't realize utility providers might charge a really big deposit. Maybe they didn't realize how much title insurance was going to cost or they underestimated the renovation uh, cost of the units. Whatever it might be, oftentimes I hear uh, too many people not raising enough money. And if they don't raise enough money, then one of two things will happen. They'll either be knocking on your door to give them more money because the deal's in trouble, or they'll be getting money from other investors that will come in later and that will dilute you. So if you get diluted, you're not gonna make the returns you thought you were gonna make. So uh, having them raise enough money up front is really important. Finally, I promised you I was gonna talk about one thing to avoid. And that one thing I want you to avoid is the shiny object syndrome. And what this is, is it mean, I mean, what I mean by this is don't chase the shiny object by making your selection based on the offering that's presenting the highest return. This disease was born from uh, the crowdfunding industry, which is kind of like the Amazon of real estate investing, right? You go to a website, you see a menu of 15 different investments you could invest in. You scan through the list of investments until you find the one that has the highest return. And you say, that's the one I'm going to invest in because it has the highest projected return. That could be the biggest mistake you ever made because remember garbage in, garbage out. If all of their assumptions are wrong, that might be why it has the highest uh, projected return. If the sponsor is a crook and everybody knows it, and so the only way they can attract capital is to throw out a really high number. 
that might be why it's the highest projected return. So just be careful about trying to chase that shiny object because there's a sea of choices out there and making the right choice is extraordinarily important because this is your hard earned money. Uh, and you know, I like to say that uh, sponsor selection is critical because a good sponsor can finagle the best outcome in the face of adverse circumstances, but a bad sponsor can destroy a perfectly good real estate deal. Don't let that happen to you. Check out the hands-off investor. Learn what you need to learn about investing in passive real estate syndications. If you are a syndicator, uh, check out the hands-off investor to read about the different things you should be thinking about uh, providing for your investors because they're going to be asking you for it so that you can be the best sponsor that you can be. And if you do have any questions about investing uh, with Praxis, you can certainly reach out to us at praxcap.com or reach out to uh, our investor relations coordinator, Bob Dreher, at the phone number on your screen or through email. That's what I have for my prepared remarks. Hopefully we've got uh, some questions we can get to. Uh, to start that process, I will stop the screen sharing here and open up uh, the chat box and, uh, and see if we've got anything. So Actually, Julius, uh, how about you? I, I think, I, thank you so much, uh, Brian. That was like an incredible, incredible um, presentation. You definitely dropped a lot of gems and uh, as much as I, I have, uh, you know, um, spent a lot of time is digesting information about multifamily real estate. I'm still learning new things, even when, when you speak. So uh, I think uh, we have a couple of questions. I have at least seven here. Some of them you actually already answered, but uh, but we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And I'm sure more questions will, will come up. Um, one of the, oh, and by the way, before people actually start dropping off, um, we actually going to have a, um, a, a proper, you know, networking session right after Brian is uh, long gone, where you get an opportunity to introduce yourself and maybe share a little bit about yourself and things of that nature. So stick around. Um, also, we ran a, a, a raffle for Brian's book, The Hands Off Investor, and the winners uh, are Clarence Carter, congratulations, and Patrick Ora. So um, Braden is going to contact both of you and get the appropriate mailing address so that we can uh, get those books to you as soon as possible. You're going to get a, a free signed copy of Brian's book. Even I don't have a signed copy. So uh, you're getting a, a, some, something incredible here. So uh, uh, I will we'll definitely be reaching out to you. So let's dive right into the questions. Um, Karen Anderson was asking why you were getting out of the West Coast, but I think you kind of answered that question a little bit. Do you still want to give a quick uh, response to that? Yeah, you know, it's it's just not one of the top markets today. Uh, if you look at forecasted future rent growth across the United States, uh, where you're seeing the highest rent growth is mostly in Southern states, uh, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, North and South Carolina. Uh, these, are the, uh, these are the markets where you're seeing the most rent growth right now. Uh, markets where you're seeing the least rent growth, in fact, even some negative rent growth, uh, are in California, New York, Seattle. Uh, so there's been, uh, you know, COVID was part of the cause for all this, but it certainly caused a, a population shift and some changes in migratory patterns. And, um, and we like to stay in front of that. I always like to say that we like to invest in markets where people are moving to and avoid markets where people are moving from. And that served us very well. And right now people are moving from West Coast markets and moving to some of these uh, Southern and Southeast markets. Oh, thank you. Um, Jeff was asking, that, excuse me, given the Federal Reserve plan to aggressively raise interest rate this year into 2023, how does that impact syndications funds deal flow, cash flow, and returns during the next five to 10 years? And may I add just the, my portion of, of, uh, of a sub question to that? Can you also comment on what you think is going to happen to the cap rates? 
um, moving forward. Obviously, no one has a magic ball to to uh, predict what's going to happen. But given your ex extensive experience in this field, and I haven't seen all the cycles that has happened in the past, um, um, what are your thoughts? You think the cap rates are going to trend up with interest rates, or do you think there's a lot of cash deals chasing a lot of deals and the cap rates are going to stay compressed? We'll be really curious to know what, what you think. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great offshoot of the interest rate question, and it's a common one. Uh, and it's also a common misconception that interest rates and cap rates uh, track in alignment with one another. And uh, uh, while I say that interest rates and cap rates are related, they're more like second cousins than twins. Uh, so I'll get into your uh, your sub question on that, Julius. But to begin with Jeff's original question, uh, you know the Federal Reserve uh, really uh, has no basis whatsoever in uh, my interpretation of market forces surrounding uh, real estate and real estate syndication deal flow and and so on. Instead, borrowing rates for real estate are set by the traders in the market. And so if you're, if you're buying on fixed rate debt, your debt's gonna be tied to the 10-year treasury generally. The 10-year treasury is set by traders on the market who are buying 10-year treasuries. And as those treasuries go up, fixed rates go up, and as fixed rates go up, it's gonna have an impact on cash flow. There's only one lever you can pull on uh, and that would be uh, price. So, you know, as uh, interest rates go up, you can buy it at a lower price relative to the amount of income. And that means, uh, you know, to Julius's point, a, a higher cap rate. But I'm, I'm going to expand on this point in a minute because that sounds a little bit contradictory to what I said at the opening of the question. So the, uh, the, the second uh the other way that people finance this real estate is through floating rate debt. And floating rate debt is typically tied to either LIBOR or SOFR, which are, uh, which are impacted by, again, traders on the trading floor. So uh, I don't really care what the Fed does. Generally, we know that uh, when the Fed increases, it won't be long before traders start increasing. But I'm more interested in what those traders are doing than what the Fed is doing. Now, when I'm looking, uh, we, we finance everything on floating rate debt, not uh, fixed. Uh, and the reason is, is fixed rate debt comes with massive yield maintenance penalties, which is a whole other topic altogether. Uh, but I prefer to let asset strategy dictate our exit, not financing strategy. So we use floating rate debt so that we can sell anytime we want without paying a huge penalty. Uh, now, floating rate debt does mean that we take on interest rate risk. Now, in the beginning, uh, we're ahead of the game because generally floating rate starts at a lower rate than fixed. So uh, it, it, uh, it may seem as though that's risky, uh, but we also have an interest rate cap. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we can only go up so high. Now, increases in rates are going to impact our cash flow. Now, we already planned for that because the, uh, the interest rate forecasts I was receiving three or four months ago already had increases in the interest rate priced in, plus we already built in a buffer, so we already knew rates were going to go up. So yes, it will impact actual cash flow, but it won't impact projected cash flow because we already projected what was going to happen. Uh, now, what we don't know is if we projected right. You know, maybe it goes higher than we thought, or not as high. So you know, we could be off a little bit, but you know, we'll just have to see. So, kind of getting back to Julius's cap rate question, I said a minute ago that you know, if the interest rate went up and borrowing costs went up, you have to pay a lower price. Well, that's not always necessarily the case. What's driving the low cap rates you see today, and let's face it, cap rates are like in the threes. <coughs> Never would a 3% cap rate really make a ton of sense, except in a rapidly rising environment. And the reason that cap rates are as low as they are is rent growth is extraordinarily high. Uh, we've seen rents in, sub in some markets almost double in a two-year period of time. And that's what's causing the low cap rates. So, you know, someone might be looking at like, yeah, it's a 3% cap rate, but, you know, uh, two years from now, I'm going to be getting 50% more rent. So this is a steal. When cap rates are going to tr uh, trend in the other direction, 
is going to be when that rent growth starts to slow down, because now you don't have the increasing income to justify the low cap rate, and you don't have the increasing income to overpower the headwind of the higher borrowing cost. So if, if uh, interest rates are rising and rent growth is falling, cap rates are going to rise probably fairly dramatically and probably fairly quickly. Now, if rent growth comes back, cap rates will fall. If interest rates fall, cap rates will likely start to fall unless rent growth starts to go negative. So now that can happen too in a recessionary environment. Uh, you can have uh, you can have an in uh, a low a reducing interest rate because the Fed and the traders are trying to uh, uh, ward off a recession. Uh, but you can also have negative rent growth because of a lack of demand, and that will cause cap rates to go up even while interest rates go down. So think of cap rates not as a, um, a relative of interest rate. Think of cap rate as a barometer or a thermometer for the real estate market overall. And when the real estate market is hot, cap rates go down. When the real estate market is not hot, cap rates go up. When is the real estate market hot? Well, it's hot when... Uh, rent growth is rapidly increasing. It's also hot when there's low interest rates. When is it not hot? It's not hot when rents are falling and it's not hot when there's high interest rates. Now those two of those things don't move in the same direction. So therefore cap rates don't track either one of them exactly. It's a combination of those two and you have to mix them together and see what output you get. Wow, that's, that's uh, a very detailed answer. I really appreciate that, uh, that insight. Uh, Karen was asking who stands in the first position to claim the asset in, in case of default. The, yeah, I think I would just make it easy. It's the bank, the lender, whoever lends uh, is, is first on the cap stack. The um, bank always gets priority and that's why the <laughs> bank is getting 3%. And the investors yep. are getting 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the next question uh, was, if I plan to diversify into a couple of syndication deals, how do I avoid running into somebody like Bernie Madoff in the syndication space? What due diligence step can I take to ensure capital pres preservation? And how can I reduce cap risk of capital loss? Just read the ends of investor and you got the... <laughs> You yeah, the there's, answer, uh, go ahead. There, there's a 350 page answer to this question. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's called the hands off investor because there are so many things to look for. I mean, first of all, let me start off with this. There's nothing you can do to eliminate the possibility of, inv of investing with a Bernie Madoff, <laughs> hands down. And, and I don't even care if you're investing in a publicly traded company. Uh, you could buy stock in Tesla and think that you have the greatest thing in the world. But if Elon Musk turns out to be a crook, raids the corporate bank account and disappears off the face of the planet on one of his rockets, you just <laughs> lost all your money. Uh, so, you know, there's there's abs there's no way to completely avoid it. So instead, what they're, they, the book will give you a lot of ways to try to pick up clues to how to weed out someone that's, you know, first of all, being in the business a long time is one indicator because that means they've, they've been around, they've done good so far. If someone's a total screw up, people are gonna figure it out and they're not gonna, they're gonna stop investing with them. They're gonna be out of business. So length in business is one, but you know, the counter argument to that is, well, Bernie Madoff did what he did for like 30 years and got away with it, right? So again, you can't eliminate all possibility, but you can defend against it. And the defense is, to invest in business plans that seem, um, that seem uh, I'm trying to think, not the word legitimate isn't really what's coming to mind, but that seem so logical, true. that seem logical uh, with underwriting that seems logical and makes sense and diversify that your investment capital among a variety of sponsors so that if one of them turns out to be a Bernie Madoff, he doesn't wipe you out. That's what happened to my friend. She invested her entire life savings with one sponsor. He's a crook. Now he's in prison and she's broke. That would not happen to her if she would have put, you know, 10% of her assets with that guy and, you know, 10% uh, with another and 10% with another and so on. That's your defense. Spread your money around. And if there's one birdie made off in your, in the crowd, you won't be completely wiped out. 
That's a great, that's a great response. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Patrick was saying, is the primary business plan of syndications to buy an old short term three to seven years and then sell? Why aren't that there are many syndications holding for longer periods or forever? And, and if forever olds exist, what about the syndication deal makes it worthy for a long-term old versus a short-term old? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, where you'll find the ultra long-term holds is generally in the family office space. And this is where you might have a family office who has legacy capital. Let's say they're a, you know, a multi-billion dollar family office. Uh, they have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate assets that they intend to hold through generations and create generational wealth. And maybe they'll even buy skyscrapers and they'll pass this down to the next generation in the family and so on. Uh, that's usually where you'll see those. And other families might come in and invest with them. Uh, that's typically where you'll see those generational holds. In most syndications that are marketed to the, you know, for the run of the mill syndication investor, you absolutely will not see legacy holds because for several reasons. One is, uh, you'll learn this if, if any of you are syndication sponsors, you'll know that one of the first questions any investor is going to ask you when considering your investment is, when will I get my money back? Uh, that's the first question that they will most most of them will ask. When do I get my money back? Uh, and how will I get my money back? And what return will I earn on it? Uh, there there needs to be some sort of definition because people are willing to get engaged, uh, but they might not want to get married till death do us part. Uh, you know, they might find out later they don't like you. They might find out later your strategy is no good or that your goals don't gel with their goals. Uh, they're not running it as well as you thought they would, whatever the case may be. And then you're just thinking, God, I can't wait for this to be over uh, and, and get my money back out of it. So no, generally you will not see longer term holds. The other reason why you don't see longer term holds is that the real estate business is one where your objective is to beat the stock market and get a higher rate of return than other investment options that are out there. When you invest in a, in a property, your goal generally will be to make some kind of an improvement to that property, which will increase its value. And that, that improvement might be something that's construction related where you're upgrading a unit. It might be personnel related where you're replacing the manager with somebody that knows what they're doing. Or it might just be market upgrades that just bring the property up to market rents because the old owner had his eye off the ball for two decades. So no matter what, you're looking for some kind of upside. Now, you don't have any upside at all if you don't capture it, which means not selling means you never capture the upside. It's just a paper gain. So you've really made nothing. Uh, most of your return is made off the exit, not off the cash flow. So if you don't ever cash in, you're never getting the upside. But most importantly, as that asset gets more and more valuable, the amount of equity that you have committed to that asset grows. So simple example, $10 million property, you put $3 million into it. You got $3 million worth of equity. Well, the property doubles in value and now it's worth 20 million. You don't just have 3 million of equity, now you have 13 because it went up by 10, you invested three. So you have 13 million in equity. So if you are gonna get a 10% return off of your 3 million, what's your return off three, uh, 13 million if it's the same dollars out. It's like, I don't know, 2%, I'm guessing. Uh, I could get a calculator out, but who has time for that? So the return becomes extraordinarily low. It's a concept I call return on equity and people tend to forget about return on equity. Uh, and that return on equity is meaningful. Now, if I could sell that property for 20 million and send you back three times what you invested, you now have 9 million to invest in the next property. And I'm assuming that the sponsor is taking off some profits, right? So you're not getting the whole 13. Maybe you're getting nine, maybe you're getting 10, 
whatever that is, let's say it's a 70, 30 split, you're getting 10 million. You get 10 million back for your three. In your next deal, you're investing all 10 million in the next opportunity. So if you're going to get an 8% return off of your 10 million, you're getting, you know, uh, what, three or four times as much money as a 10% return on your initial $3 million investment. And even more than that, considering what it would have been if your 10 million was still locked up in that first deal. So in order to maximize returns, you have to cycle the capital. Wow, that's, uh, that's incredible because that's a great counter argument to like some of the long-term old strategies. Um, but just a quick follow-up question to that. How do you respond to folks who say, well, you could just still do the same thing by refinancing um, and taking that cash out um, tax-free um, instead of having to pay long-term capital gains tax on the, on the sale event? Um, what would be your response to that, sir? Well, first of all, you're never going to get all of it back out. So let's just assume my previous example, you might get to 70% uh, loan to value ratio on your $20 million property. So you're still going to have six, uh, $4 million tied up in that first asset, earning a very minuscule uh, rate of return. Uh, whereas you could invest all of it into the next asset. That's one point. The other point is you already juiced the squeeze. So, you know, if you look at, a, at what you can do to a property in the early period, you, can, you might be able to increase rents 30% in the first two years by doing renovations and bringing rents to market. But after that, you now hand control over to the market. There's no longer anything you can physically do to improve the results. All you can do is just let the market do whatever it's going to do, whether it goes up or down or whatever. And if the market is a 2% rent increases on an annualized basis, that's all you're going to get versus you could take that same 4 million that got stuck in that first property that you couldn't get on a refi. You could invest that in the next deal where you might see that 30% rent increase in two years and you're still going to beat your results. I'm going to have to watch this video a few more times to really uh, get the details of what you're saying there. I completely get it, but it's so profound and I don't want the um, incredible insight that you're sharing with us right now to skip, to, 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 to be missed by like the folks in the audience. These are like gems that Brian is dropping on us. So I uh, really appreciate you for that. Um, let's quickly run through the next questions just to you know, really get as much uh, from you as possible. Um, if somebody was asking, is this like a REIT? It's not, but I'll let you give a quick answer to that. It's kind of like a REIT, but kind of not. You know, in a REIT, uh, a REIT can be uh, either traded or non-traded. So if it's a traded REIT, it's on the stock market. You can buy it through the publicly traded um, uh, exchanges. The difference is, is a REIT is... Uh, correlated to the stock market. So if real estate stocks go down, REITs can go down. Uh, but private real estate investments tend not to follow that same track. So there's less correlation in a passive real estate syndication than you would find in a REIT. But it's a similar idea. The concept of a REIT is a lot of people invest into one vehicle and then it buys real estate. A syndicate is essentially the same thing, but the structure is different and there's no correlation to the stock market. Thank you so much. Um, Jordan um, was asking, what are your thoughts on investing in real estate outside of your country? Just a quick response to that. Well, I don't have a lot of experience to be able to tie into that, at least as it relates to investing outside of my country and into another country. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to do that, but I will tell you that a lot of people from outside of the U.S. invest inside the U.S. because our real estate is considered extraordinarily high quality. So I would say that a lot of people are doing it. It's very common and U.S. real estate is very attractive, even to foreign investors. Uh, U.S. capital being expatriated to other countries is a lot less common. I, I would say it's not done. It's just a lot less common than the other way around, in my, in my view. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, Samir was asking, do you need to be an accredited investor? What's the minimum? Um, I'll, I'll let you answer quickly. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it it there's no single answer to this. It really depends on the syndication sponsor and the offering that they're presenting. Some sponsors will uh, allow unaccredited investors uh, to invest in their offerings if they have some kind of pre-existing relationship or that person was not directed to them through some sort of advertising. 
Uh, some sponsors just flat out won't work with non-accredited investors. They have to be accredited. And some sponsors do offerings under a specific exemption of securities law called 506C, which allows them to advertise their offering, but prohibits them from admitting any non-accredited investors. So those sponsors, at least for those particular offerings, are prohibited from allowing non-accredited investors. So it really kind of varies. If you're directing the question at me and our firm, we do have opportunities for both. More, most of our opportunities are for accredited investors. Every once in a while, we'll have one we can open to non-accredited. Our minimums tend to start at 100,000. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Kevin uh, was asking that he's a, I'm a university student looking to get started on real estate investing. What was the common challenge that persisted while you were starting out given limited capital and little experience? How did you navigate this and what strategies would you use given your current experience? The most common challenge, the, the biggest challenge for me is when I first started in this business, I had no money and no connections. I didn't know a single person that was worth a million dollars, much less had a hundred grand to invest. So what my biggest challenge was raising capital. Uh, and to combat that, what I did is I started really small. I started out house flipping. I started, when I did my first fund, I opened it up to people that I knew, coworkers of mine, in fact, with a $5,000 minimum investment. Uh, and that's how I, that was my very first syndication was $5,000 minimums. And so I would say, you know, to navigate it, just stay in your lane. You know, if you only know people that have five grand that start where you are, uh, get some experience, get a track record, produce some result, then you can show more people and they'll tell two friends who will tell two friends. Our business has grown from a few coworkers investing $5,000 minimums. And now we have over 2000 investors, uh, most of which are accredited and many of which are worth more than 10 million without a single bit of advertising, it's all word of mouth and referrals and it grew organically. You can certainly do that. Uh, just make sure that you're targeting your business plan to the audience you actually have. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Tebron asked, um, so is it better to invest outside of your state? How do I invest in other markets besides my own state? Well, it depends. I mean, if you live in Arizona, it's not better to invest in another state. Uh, that's that market is absolutely on fire. Uh, but if you live in California or New York or you know Detroit or you know some markets that aren't doing so well, uh, then investing out of state is an absolutely uh, uh, intriguing option. Uh, now, navigating that is difficult. And this is where passive real estate syndications are a solution for a lot of people because they invest in real estate out of state in a passive real estate syndication without ever getting on an airplane. I mean, you know, they, the sponsor is the one doing all of that. They vet the sponsor and the opportunity based upon the materials that are presented and what they learned out of the book or what they learned on their own or the school of hard knocks or whatever, but they don't have to actually go out of state. If you, if you want to invest in real estate as direct owner out of state, I did that. My first out of state investment, my wife and I bought it. It was all the way across the country. I got on an airplane. I flew out there. I looked at it. I liked it. I bought it. Um, and so you, you, you can absolutely invest out of state, but be prepared. You need to go see the asset. Don't just do the blind. I never saw it. I'm going to buy it off the internet kind of approach. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Yivi was asking, what's your overall strategy to buy our own old properties that has positive cash flow indefinitely or exit within two to five years? I think you kind of answered that earlier, but three to five. Uh, yeah, our plan is, is generally three to five. Now we underwrite everything as if we're going to hold it for 10 years, because guess what? We might have to. We're a slave to the market. And if the market isn't in our favor at the time we go to sell, we might have to hold longer. And also we might hold less. So, you know, we we're selling two assets this year. We've owned for a year and a half. Both of them were intended to be five-year holds, but we're beating our five-year sale projection in 18 months. Get out now. Makes sense. Um, what's your um, what? Adam was asking um, what impact will Biden's proposed 1031 exchange have, and will there be a difference for that to active versus passive investors? Well, the uh, the question for those who might not know is: there's been proposals floated around to eliminate the 1031 exchange, which allows people to sell 
a, a parcel of real estate and uh, buy another parcel in exchange without paying any tax subject to some guidance and rules. Uh, there, there have been proposals floated around to eliminate it. I don't know that it's gonna happen. In fact, I, I kind of tend to doubt that we're gonna get there, that there's, I don't know that there's legislative support to, for this to pass. But if there is, I couldn't be happier. Uh, I hate the 1031 exchange, uh, both from a, a real estate owner's perspective and a syndicator's perspective. From the syndication perspective, the 1031 exchange is my competition because someone is gonna say like, well, I'm coming out of this 1031 exchange, can I invest in your syndication? The answer is no, it's not like kind. You're buying shares in a company, not real estate. So no, you can't 1031 into a syndication. So instead they have to stay in the active property business and go buy some other property and remain as an active owner if they wanna get the tax break. Uh, so eliminating the 1031 exchange would eliminate that. People would stop doing that and they would all go passive and it would be a massive boon for the passive syndication sponsors because there'd be tons of capital opened up that would come their way. From a real estate owner's perspective, I hate the 1031 exchange because if I go to sell a property, yes, I can exchange into another one and not pay tax. I should say I can defer my tax, which is the real truth, uh, but I have to identify the replacement property in 45 days and I have to close within 180. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if any of you are out there in the market looking to buy real estate right now, your chances of finding a really good deal in 45 days are somewhere between nowhere and no way in hell. And so that means there's one way for you to buy a property within the timeline, and that is to pay a tax. This tax is paid to the, uh, the seller of the property you're buying in the form of you paying an above market price for that real estate. Mm -hmm. So either you sell and pay your tax to Uncle Sam, or you do a 1031 exchange and you pay the seller more than the property is worth. Either way, there's friction on your dollars. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think right now we've been going straight for almost 30 minutes. Um, I think there's going to be a chance to, for maybe one more question so that we can be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and I, I will end with um, Elena Keith's question um, that said, I mean, you, what did you mean by in order to maximize return, you have to cycle the capital? Can you go over that again? Uh, I'll, I'll let that be the last question so that we could uh, let you uh, head out. Yeah, to maximize the return, you have to cycle the capital. So imagine that you're, you're the sole investor in, in a parcel of real estate that you bought for $10 million with $3 million of your own money. Uh, now, uh, in two years, you made that property worth $20 million. So you sell, you get your $13 million out, right? The $3 million you put in plus the $10 million gain. I'm ignoring things like sponsor friction or real estate transaction costs. Let's keep it simple. You get $13 million out. You invest that $13 million as a 30% down payment in a property that's worth uh, $40 million. So you started with a $10 million property that doubled in value. Now you got a $40 million property. If that $40 million property doubles in value, it's now worth $80 million. If you would have stayed where you were and that first 20, $10 million property that became 20 became 40, you would have made $30 million on your 3 million. Instead, by doing this cycle, uh, you bought, a, you, bought uh, you made 10 million on the first one, you cycle that into a $40 million deal that doubled, so you made 40, so you now made $50 million. So you made 50 million instead of 30 million. That's the difference. Wow. Cycling that capital out is powerful. And, and, and with that, uh, Brian can just drop the mic. And I can officially say that we've been doing this meetup for at least uh, two years. And Brian, this is hands down, and pardon the pun, um, <laughs> hands off investor. Um, this has been hands down been the, the best, best um, uh, um, gem filled meetup that we've ever had. And uh, we just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you for blessing us with your presence with your resources, your knowledge. Um, there are so many other questions that are coming in. 
And I personally have so many other questions for you and we cannot wait to hopefully have you back if you will uh, come back and join us. Um, but this is, uh, I, I'm sure this won't be the last time, hopefully that you will uh, come and share some of these gems with us. Uh, I just, on behalf of Excite Capital, um, my co-founders, um, Leslie and Tenny, and um, the entire team, Braden, Kalea, and everybody else at Excite Capital, and everybody on this um, call today, we just want to say a big, big thank you, and uh, can't can, can say thank you enough. Can, can we just give a, a round of applause to, to thank Brian? Thank you. I appreciate that, Julius. I, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm glad I could deliver for you guys, and I appreciate you inviting me to be here uh today to uh to speak to your group and i wish you all lots of luck and and prosperity in your pursuit so thanks for having me here thank you brian really brian, appreciate brian I'll, be, I'll be in touch <laughs> thank you Danny. sounds good <laughs> take care so you too and for everybody else please stick around this is gonna be um typically we would have ended the meetup right now but we're gonna take the next 15 minutes to just do a little intro for those that may want to introduce themselves uh to to the entire group we really, really appreciate you all for joining us. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here with us. We don't take that for granted. And um, we really, really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you a little better and get to uh, interact with you. Um, at Excite Capital, we were very fortunate two weeks ago to close a $17.45 million deal in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a 113 unit class A deal. And many of you on this call were joined us on that journey. And uh, we just want to say a special thank you to you. Um, we can't, I mean, the work has started already and we can't wait to continue to update you with how fantastically well that, that deal is going. Um, this uh, particular meetup today has been an inspiring one and we cannot wait to close the loop on some of these deals and and pass on some of this great, great returns to you, our investors. So um, for those that may be interested in joining us in the next deal, please feel free to um, click the link that is being put in to the chat box. And for those of you that want to introduce yourself um, to the entire crew, please feel free to come on camera. Um, since we have still, uh, you know, we had over 70 um, 70 something people earlier, almost 80 people. We still have at least 30 of, of us um, here today. And um, we may not be able to get to everybody. So if you want to uh, introduce yourself, just come on camera real quickly and uh, introduce yourself and let's uh, have a nice little conversation. Um, look forward to uh, getting to know you a little more. Patrick, I think you're the first person to jump in camera. Please go for it. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Patrick Ora. Um, I am a um, IT professional uh, with uh, that. I actually, I also invest invest in um, real estate. I have a small portfolio in Maryland, Virginia, and Texas, and I am looking for the opportunity to scale. And syndication investing is one I came across when I joined your meetup maybe a month ago. Awesome. So, awesome. have some, have some funds. Want to want to deploy them, and I'm waiting for the next deal. Fantastic. Well, we cannot wait to go on that journey with you, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining the meetup and becoming one of the repeat faces. Um, there are a few other faces here that I, there are some people actually in this team that's invested in all four of our deals that we've had so far, wow. <laughs> and, and uh, we call them the Excite Unicorns, you know. So, um, and it's been it's been a great great uh, experience, just you know, going on this journey with our community of investors, and and it, it means a lot to us to 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 be able to be able to present these opportunities, and definitely stay tuned. We're working very hard um, to. Uh, present future opportunities to uh, people in our community. And that will come very shortly. We're working extremely hard. Anybody else interested in uh, doing an intro? Seems like nobody else came on camera. So um, if you just want to introduce yourself, feel free to unmute since uh, no one else is, uh, people are a little shy today. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself, please feel free to. It seems like people people are relatively feeling relatively uh, shocked. 
Well, I, I can speak. Go ahead, Elena. All right. Um, and um, thank you so much for um, a great presentation to and bringing new interesting uh, experts. So that's that's really I just learn every time something new. And uh, my name is Elena Keith, and I I'm just buying single family home in Miami as of now. So that's what I'm involved in, and I'm looking into future future wise doing investment in the larger properties and um, yes, just exploring uh, syndication and uh, reads and other options. What's what's available? That's, so thank that's you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Elena. And thanks for always being a, a, a very active participant in this meetup. Your questions are always fun and exciting and interesting. I didn't, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to all of your questions today. My apologies. Hopefully, we'll have Brian Burke back again soon and we'll be able to get him to answer all those questions for you. Um, I see Dr. Audley Mackel. And an amazing mentor and awesome orthopedic surgeon. Um, and so, <laughs> and, and, uh, and Nu also has been part of uh, this uh, community for a while. Uh, I saw him come on video. Please go ahead, uh, Dr. Mackle. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oni. I, I uh, uh, thank you for that compliment. Uh, I think we both want to be, uh, or at least I want to be, like you, an amazing. Uh, a real estate passive investor. So uh, thanks for having Brian Burke on. Uh, I've got his book. I've tried to listen to it on audio uh, and it's one of the more challenging books to read, but I think by having him on live really helps understand how he thinks and how he goes about uh, doing his amazing business. So uh, thanks for having him. It was a great, great presentation. Appreciate it. So, so, so much. Yeah, I agree. That book is a uh... It's a little difficult to read um, if you're new to syndications, no questions about it. Um, a better book to actually, um, it, that delivers it in a more bite-sized fashion is Will Barrow Profits by Gino Barbaro. Gino Barbaro and uh, uh, what's what's the name of? Jack and Gino. Jack Stanziano and Gino Barbaro. Yeah? Right. So, so Will Barrow Profits, if you still, kind of confused about some of the terms because some of these terms are like completely, uh, it's a different language by itself and it could be get a little overwhelming sometimes. Uh, Wheelbarrow Profit is a nice one to kind of start to, to bite, bite it down. ABCs of Passive Investments also is another good book. Um, and then maybe you, then you graduate into self Investor, which is just packed with a lot of gems but it could be, could be a little bit of a, a, a work to, to handle. Um, Karen? Thanks, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Michael. Um, Karen Anderson, you, you wanna say a few words? Karen actually was very active in the chat. She was answering a lot of questions and she's uh, had quite a bit of experience in experience investing in syndications. Um, we look forward to her joining us on one of ours soon. So um, I see a lot of um, familiar names in the in in the in the um, um, chat right now. Thelma, welcome, good to see you. Daryl, thank you for all your investments and in for for uh, always being you know a part of this community. Um, Jay Miller, always good to see you. Um, and, um, and Edwin, oh, wow. Ed, 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 thank you so much for your investments and for, um, all, you know, for your support. Uh, look forward to many more in the future. Um, so yeah, so with that, I mean, I, I definitely, do anybody have any additional questions or, 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 or comments? I want to be respectful of people's times, and uh, I I definitely want to be able to give you some of your time back today, since we're already over time. Well, if I don't hear anything else, uh, I guess I'll call it. Um, every Monday morning, every Monday evening, uh, first Monday of the month, we will um, always have this meetup. So first Monday of the month, month, just keep your calendars open. Once again, I know you all have 
many, many opportunities to be in many places, but you are here with us. We really appreciate it. On behalf of Excite Capital, I want to say a big thank you to you all. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Yeah, everybody. Bye, everybody.